we can use the atomic orbitals of the hydrogen atom to start to build up molecular orbitals. So if we start with the ground state of the hydrogen atom, this is the 1s state, and we take two of those hydrogen atoms and combine them to end up with two molecular orbitals. One of those molecular orbitals is a sigma bonding molecular orbital, and one of them is a sigma starred antibonding molecular orbital. Total energy remains the same, but the sigma orbital is lower in energy, so we can form the hydrogen molecule. And from a knowledge of what the s orbitals look like, we can build up a knowledge of what the sigma orbitals are going to look like. Instead of just s to p, s to d, we can start to look at sigma to sigma stars, bonding to antibonding orbital. If we build up a potential energy surface, that is looking at the total energy of the system as a function of the separation of the two atoms for the particularly simple case of a diatomic molecule. So to build up these potential energy surfaces, usually we start with our atoms at some nominal infinite distance apart. If they're infinitely far apart, then there's no interaction between them. So we call that interaction energy, the potential of the total system, we call that zero. Then as the two atoms approach one another, their atomic orbitals begin to overlap. Let's say it's the ground state of the hydrogen atom, therefore only the 1s orbitals are occupied. As they approach one another, those occupied orbitals overlap and they begin to form the molecular orbitals. And in the case that the molecular orbital is more stable than the separated atoms, you end up with an attractive potential, the energy decreases, and we can start to form a chemical bond. Of course, at some point, R is going to become very, very small, and at that point, you're trying to push the nuclei of the two atoms close together. Then there's going to be a very strong repulsive interaction resisting that, and so the energy is going to shoot back up again. If we plot that kind of potential energy surface, we end up with a, a shape that we call the Morse potential surface, and that Morse potential surface then tells us something about the nature of the bond formed between, in general, between diatomic molecules. In the case of the hydrogen molecule, we make the bonding orbital, we also make the antibonding orbital, and the antibonding orbital is always repulsive. So what we end up with is this kind of shape here. So here we are, starting out right out here at infinity. These things approach one another. At this point, the atomic orbitals are starting to overlap. So the bonding orbital is forming, and it forms, comes down here, until we get to this, what we call the equilibrium bond length. And then at that point, this nuclear repulsion starts to take over, and the energy shoots right up. Okay, as we're forming the bonding molecular orbital, at the same time, we're forming the antibonding molecular orbital, although it's not populated with any electrons just yet. But that is always a repulsive surface. Now let's see what happens if we bring in a photon and we move from this state, the bonding state, to the antibonding state. Is what happens when we do this is that we're moving an electron between two <laughs> molecular orbitals. So we're moving the electron and electrons, according to something called the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, move much, much faster than nuclei. Because electrons are small and light, nuclei are massive. This coordinate here is the nuclear separation. So during this electronic transition where we take our photon and we annihilate the photon's energy and transfer it to the molecule in an absorption, that absorption occurs at the same internuclear separation. So our transition always goes vertically. We refer to this kind of vertical transition as a Frank Condon transition, but then our system has arrived here and suddenly it's very unstable because there's no minimum here. The potential energy is going in this direction. So this is forcing the atoms to separate. So if we electronically excite our hydrogen molecule into the antibonding state, then immediately the hydrogen molecule dissociates into its separate atoms. So the molecule is unstable with respect to dissociation. OK, so let's start to look at molecular orbitals in multi-electron atoms. We can have all of the s and the p orbitals occupied by electrons in multi-electron atoms. And therefore, we have to worry about the bonding and antibonding formed between the s and the p orbitals. So as we've already said, if we take two s atomic orbitals and we combine them together, then we end up with sigma and sigma starred pairs of molecular orbitals. If we take two p atomic orbitals and then we combine them in a head-on fashion, then we refer to that kind of overlap as a pi sigma or a pi sigma starred molecular orbital. If we bring our 2p electrons along in this orientation, so that they approach one another in a side-on fashion, then the overlap that we get there yields pi and pi star orbitals. And in some molecules, the atomic orbitals, which are populated, do not get involved in bonding at all, and we refer to those as non-bonding orbitals. So in general, we end up with sigma, pi, n, pi star and sigma star orbitals. The sigma has the largest stabilization, 
This is associated actually with the degree of overlap. And the sigma star has the largest energy gain on formation. For a sigma, sigma star transition is going to be a very high energy transition right? because this is a very stable uh, molecular orbital. This is a very unstable antibonding molecular orbital. So the transition between them requires a lot of energy. The pi orbitals are somewhat less stabilized than the sigma orbitals. And correspondingly, since we have to balance around zero, the pi star orbitals are less unstable. So the transition between them is of lower energy than the sigma to sigma star. And of course, the n orbitals do not change their energy at all with respect to the atoms because they're not involved in making new molecular orbitals. That means that if those levels are populated, then we can have, for example, n to pi star transitions, and those will be of even lower energy, right? Because there's no stabilization here. So if the selection rule allows us to go from n to pi star, then that will be a very low energy transition. So sigma to sigma star, that's the highest energy pi to pi star, that's of lower energy, and n to pi star is of lower energy still.